everyone. I'm Marlon Marshall. We are live from the White House following the President's fifth State of the Union address. We are here with a fantastic live audience who's very excited following the address. <laughs> We're also here with you. We want to make sure that we get your questions answered. Please tweet with us, hashtag so to chat If you have questions, make sure you're tweeting it to us, hashtag so to chat We have a great panel, and we're going to get started writing the questions. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. First question is from Twitter. This is from Aurora Hernandez. Hello, Aurora. Aurora, how are you doing? Uh, this is, what are we doing to encourage STEM education for minorities and women? This sounds like a good question for you, Roberto. Do you want to take it? All right, I'm happy to, uh, and uh, I'm really happy to have the question. You know, the president started this evening with the incredible difference that America's teachers make uh, in the lives of our students. And one of the most important things we can do to strengthen STEM education is to gr get a great teacher uh, in every classroom uh, and to support those teachers in all that they do to help our students succeed. Uh, the president believes we need to do more to raise standards, raise our expectations, and up our game, particularly in science and math and technology and engineering education. Uh, and we have an effort that he's referred to uh, tonight uh, across our race to the top states, 19 states with new plans around strengthening STEM education, everything from professional development for teachers to opening new STEM education academies. Uh, one of the other things that he talked about tonight that's critical here is uh, reforming and redesigning our high schools. Uh, we know one of the best ways to unlock uh, the potential for our young people in STEM education is to help them apply what they're learning in their classroom in the real world. That's particularly important in science and math. Uh, and we have uh, uh, extensive effort underway to, uh, to begin that process. Fantastic. Thank you for answering. Appreciate that. We're going to go uh, second question, also from Twitter. Why are agriculture prices still on the rise even though fuel prices have dipped over the past year? That question is from Zvon Landfair from Twitter. Any of you want to take that one? All right. Sure, hey, I'll Mr. take Dan, a cut at that. I think that um, you know, what you heard tonight uh, from the president was he outlined a, a, a really robust agenda on, on energy and climate um, going back to the uh, historic speech that he gave last June on climate change at Georgetown where he laid out a, a robust uh, climate plan that includes steps to historic steps to cut carbon emissions, to prepare our communities for the impacts of climate change, and also to lead the international effort to uh, uh, address this global threat. So I think um, energy is closely linked to agriculture and uh, we'll be taking a number of steps in the coming months to implement that plan. Awesome, thank you. Uh, reminder, if you're online, we have, uh, please tweet at us, hashtag so to chat. Uh, let me take the moment quickly to introduce our panel first. Starting from left to right, we have Josh Ernest, our Principal Deputy uh, Press Secretary. Bessie Stevenson, one of our Economic Advisors. Roberto Rodriguez, an Education uh, Policy Advisor here. Dan Utek, an Energy and Climate Change Advisor. And Kristen Link-Young, a Healthcare Advisor. Please give it up for our panel. These are fantastic folks who work every day to advance uh, the, poli uh, the policies that the president laid out uh, in today's State of the Union. Uh, but before we take more questions, I want to point out the video. How many of you have heard about the uh, big block of cheese day that the White House is having tomorrow? All right. If you're online, you haven't heard about it, we want everyone to take a moment and check out this video. So take a look. So you're telling me that back in 1837, President Andrew Jackson had 24 horses haul a 1,400-pound block of cheese to the White House and then published an official invitation for any citizen to drop by for a snack and mingle with the president, with the cabinet, with legislators and diplomats? That's amazing. The People's House, right? Right. H how did you get this number? Well, Melina gave it to me. Is that Jay Carney? Is this about the cheese? Yeah, why am I working with you again? Put him on speaker. Hey, Jay. What's up, Molina? So look, I think the White House having a big block of cheese day is a great idea. Really? Big block of cheese day? Launch Operation Cheddar. No, 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 it was code Gouda. Whatever, it's happening. Big block of cheese day. Big block of cheese day. 
big block of cheese day. Come on, guys, don't leave me hanging. What's he talking about? The first ever virtual big block of cheese day. Dozens of White House officials answering your questions in real time online. Check it out at whitehouse.gov slash cheese day. All right. Don't leave Jake Carney hanging. Check us out tomorrow, Big Block of Cheese Day. Let's take a couple questions from the audience. Raise your hands if you got a question. Remember to say your name and your question. Let's start right here. All right, stand up, name, question. My name is Stephanie Levy, and my question goes back to what you were saying about STEM education. And I think it's great that you have these initiatives to support teachers, but if we're also going to go back to the example of students, for instance, in Montana last year, when you looked at who took the AP Computer Science exam, zero girls and zero students of color took it. So I'm curious what you're going to be doing to support teachers and the students who are just as eager to learn. Right. It's a great question. And we know we have our work cut out, particularly to do more to engage uh, and support uh, our girls uh, and our students of color, particularly in these, in these STEM subjects. We know that has to begin early. Uh, right, so we're starting with uh, making sure that we have opportunities for those students to begin to excel, you know, even beginning as early as fourth, fifth, sixth grade into the middle school and then into the high school years uh, and make sure that, you know, we have great teachers that are reaching them and they have opportunities to learn, you know, internships, externships. We know mentorships make an uh, incredible, uh, and mentoring makes an incredible uh, difference uh, in the lives of those students. We have successful programs. Uh, out there that are focused on college prep, uh, you know, programs like Upper Bound Math Science, our Gear Up programs, uh, and a whole host of other programs that help support a pipeline, um, particularly for our uh, first generation uh, students to be able to think about uh, pursuing a college uh, career and a college degree early in the STEM subjects. All right. Well, the, whole, I feel like the whole room has their hand up. All right, let's go over here. We'll come to you. We'll do as many questions as we can. Again, hashtag so to chat. Say your name and your question. Thank you. Um, Monique Reiser, a recent report from Child Care Aware of America found that in 31 states and the District of Columbia, child care was more expensive than the average cost of public tuition and fees um, at a state university. So we just want to know a little bit about what the administration plans to do to make child care more affordable for families. All right, question about child care more affordable for families. Anybody up there okay. want to take that one? Uh, sure, I'll, uh, first of all, as you all know, the president supports a pre-K for all, and uh, extending that pre-K is obviously an important part uh, of, of covering kids. I, I have a four-year-old myself, so I know that that's a, a year in school is a year not in, uh, in daycare. Um, and you know he's going to be working with states, he's going to be working with cities, he's going to be working with foundations to see what he can do um, while pushing for Congress to enact legislation. Um, and additionally, thinking about ways in which um, you know, fully understanding the costs uh, of, of child care are disproportionately born in those early years when you don't have access to school. Um, so trying to think about what more we can do along, along those lines. And, I, and just to add to that, you know, in addition to the affordability question you raise on child care, we also have to make sure that our children have opportunities, every opportunity to learn. Uh, and we know that learning begins at birth. Uh, so our administration is taking bold steps to make sure we're improving the quality of our child care subsidy system. And we have uh, regulations that uh, are currently under review and for public comment uh, to help strengthen our child care subsidy system as well. These are great, great questions so far. Let's take one more from up here. You, sir. My name is Michael Orth. I'm a teacher in Kenosha, Wisconsin. On my students' list of things is college affordability. Um, and it also hits me at home. I have two kids. They're in eighth and ninth grade. They're going to be going on to college very soon. I'm still paying my own student loan debt. And now I'm going to take on the cost of sending them to college as well. Uh, the president started to talk about college affordability um, and, and extending those benefits. What can we do to help parents and students? Yes, well, good education question so far. You know, that, that <laughs> it's an important issue, and you and 37 million other borrowers across the country, uh, student loan borrowers, are working to help repay those loans. The president wants to make sure that uh, uh, our borrowers have every opportunity 
to manage that student loan debt uh, at an affordable rate. You heard him talk tonight about uh, enhancements to the income-based repayment program, what we call the pay-as-you-earn program that will help our uh, borrowers peg their monthly payments uh, to 10% of their discretionary income. We believe that's a huge benefit uh, that could reach uh, millions of borrowers and we're trying to take steps uh, and, and we've taken steps over the past several months to make sure we're reaching more borrowers to inform them of those options. Uh, ultimately, we also know that this issue of college affordability is a shared responsibility. We have a, we have a responsibility at the federal level to make sure that the Pell Grant is strong, you know, that, and, and we've raised that Pell Grant amount by $900 for our for maximum award for our students. Uh, we're trying to do more to make sure that uh, states keep up their end of the bargain uh, and invest in our colleges and universities so that, you know, those, uh, those um, uh, so that the tuition doesn't continue to rise at our state colleges and universities in particular. Uh, and we know that our institutions have to do their part as well, and we're trying to promote more uh, innovation uh, in the uh, space and also more affordability, more, more affordable options and high value options for our families. Uh, and so, you know, I want to refer everyone to uh, our college scorecard. Uh, which you can find at www.ed.gov or at whitehouse.gov. This is a tool the president uh, rolled out last year that will help uh, America's families better uh, provide a snapshot around college affordability and value. Uh, and we, ultimately, we want to do all we can to make that path toward a college degree an affordable and an attainable one for all of our students. Thank you, Roberto. I'm going to give Roberto a break for a second. All right. <laughs> uh, but, and while I do, have you guys heard about the President's Google Hangout on Friday? Google Plus Hangout? If you hadn't heard about it, if you're online, you haven't heard about it, we have a quick video for you. We want all of you to be get online, check out the Google Plus Hangout, and ans uh, ask questions to the President himself this Friday. Check this out. The special presidential train has just rolled into track one. It is a very great honor to present your president. I've had a most pleasant time meeting the people of the United States. I've talked to all these people, and I'm glad many people have talked to me. And I'm glad of the privilege of having a chance to meet you face to face. Join Google Plus Hangout. It's going to be good. We're going to take a couple questions from Twitter, and I'll get back to the audience uh, in this room as well, too. So uh, from folks online, this is from Rev Thomas uh, at Knowledge Economy. How can we keep the U.S. the global leader in the knowledge economy and still spread the benefits to the rest of the world? Good question about the knowledge economy. Anybody want to take that one? We should have, <laughs> the economist should answer the question. <laughs> well, you heard the president talk today about how important it is that we continue to fund research. Um, and that's obviously been, uh, you know, the funding of research uh, is, is very important. You know, this year we had all the Nobel laureates um, uh, who won this year who were American. And every single one of them had actually received funding from the government. So that government research, uh, that government funding ties into making America a strong place to do research. And it makes us uh, a place that attracts people from all over the world. As uh, someone who did my PhD right here in the United States, I can tell you uh, that my classroom was a global classroom. There were people from all over the world. And as long as we continue to be a leader in research, we're going to attract people from all over the world who come here to learn, to work, to do research with us, and then to take the, that knowledge back home uh, to their country, uh, to other countries, and they disseminate it. So I think the way that we continue to do that is to continue to fund primary research here in the United States, to continue to attract foreign researchers to the United States to learn, to participate, to be colleagues, and then going back to, to their countries um, to foster a research community there. Thank you very much. We're going to take another one. I see hands go up. Go on to Twitter again. Go on to Twitter again. <laughs> and a reminder again, hashtag SoToChat uh, if you want to ask a question. We have some good questions coming in. This is from at CZ Teacher Man. What are you doing to protect the rights of workers to band together and fight for their rights. 
see some folks like that one. Who wants to take that one? Well, Josh, I'll, what are you thinking? I, I, I'll take a shot at it. It's, I think the Secretary of Labor may be joining us a little later, so maybe we'll come back to, and give him a chance that to answer this question. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good surprise! at Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> I'm not very good at keeping surprises, so I guess you all know that about me now. Uh, the, w the one thing that I will say is that uh, you know, one aspect of this president's career uh, throughout his time in public service has been his strong support for working people and certainly for the rights of workers to organize. Uh, and that has been something that has uh, you know, characterized his, uh, his time in public service. Uh, and that is something that he has spent time as president working on as well. And uh, it is not uncommon for the president to uh, meet with uh, uh, leaders and organized labor uh, to talk about uh, how the different issues uh, that he's dealing with on a daily basis uh, are affecting their members and how, they're, and, and how the policies that he's dealing with on a regular basis are affecting working people. Uh, and so that's something that he spends a lot of time on. It's a, it's a system that he believes is really important. Uh, and, um, and maybe we can uh, talk about it a little bit later with our surprise guest. Talk about it later with our surprise guest. Let me more surprises for this. Uh, how you guys feeling? Feeling good? Hope you guys are feeling good online. All right, let's do a couple audience questions. Let's go in the back left somewhere. Go ahead. Hey, hey, go ahead. Welcome. Yeah. Oh, go here. I'm uh, Amy Lynn Smith from Michigan, and my question actually comes from the mayor of Southfield, who uh, lives near Detroit, as we all do, and we would like to know um, how the White House uh, administration's policies moving forward are going to help cities like Detroit, um, not in terms of a bailout, but in terms of just how these policies are going to support cities who are working hard to come back uh, through their own efforts. Uh, I, I, can, I can talk about this a little bit. Um, when it, as it comes... Uh, as it relates to the city of Detroit, the administration has put together uh, a team uh, of senior individuals representing different aspects of the administration uh, to help try to coordinate the federal assistance that can go to a, uh, assist the citizens of Detroit. Now, just to be clear, this doesn't mean additional federal money necessarily, but it helps to make sure that the, that the leaders in the city of Detroit have the technical know-how to apply for the kinds of grants and assistance that they're already available that's already available to them through the federal government uh, and how that can best be applied to make a difference in their communities. So there are, there are individuals from uh, uh, leaders from the Har uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, this, uh, the Department of the Treasury. Uh, I know that the Department of Education is involved in this because there's money for schools that can be used to benefit the schools in Detroit. Uh, this is a, a model that we're trying to use uh, in other cities that, that, that don't face a problem as quite as significant as Detroit, fortunately. Uh, but still can benefit from the kind of know-how that administration officials have about what kind of resources are available to cities. Uh, that there is an important role for the federal government to play in supporting cities as they try to meet the basic needs of their citizens. So uh, this involves, uh, uh, like I said, helping schools uh, where possible. In some cases it involves helping local community health care centers. Uh, this is something that the Department of Health and Human Services has increased funding for pretty significantly over the last several years under the, under the president's leadership. And there are, so there are a range of ways that the administration is trying to coordinate our assistance to cities. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's important for leaders in these communities to have a say and to dictate what they want their communities to look like. And so the administration, I know, is also very sensitive to ensuring that people in their individual communities are empowered to make decisions about what they want their communities to look like, what the priorities should be in terms of making investments of resources, to try to turn their communities into the kinds of places where they want to uh, live out the American dream, raise a family, uh, and retire. So this is, uh, this is an important focus, and this is, frankly, this has been, an, this was particularly important earlier in the administration when we are in the depths of the economic uh, recession, that uh, we saw that a lot of communities that were struggling before the recession uh, were hit the hardest. Uh, and so they had to work the hardest to come back. Uh, and that's been the focus of, uh, of this administration uh, since the very first day because of the crisis this president inherited. Um, and we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, but we are looking for more opportunities where we can partner with local communities to help, uh, help them coordinate some federal assistance uh, and, and make their communities as strong and as vibrant and as dynamic as they would like them to be. As, as the economist, I just have to add that, you know, what's important for Detroit, what's important for every city in America is we make the economy as strong as possible. 
and that we do things like strengthen our infrastructure so that people can get around and that we can get to our jobs quickly, we can be as productive as possible. Um, the President's talk tonight about his infrastructure ambitions, cutting red tape for infrastructure investment, doing more to invest in infrastructure. And the other thing is, of course, building our manufacturing. I just you can't uh, go without saying that after seeing manufacturing jobs decline for over a decade, we've now seen several years of growth in manufacturing. We're seeing our manufacturing sector come back, and the President plans to launch four new manufacturing innovation institutes in 2014. So strengthening manufacturing and infrastructure and strengthening the economy are, of course, all part of supporting every city in America. Awesome. We had a fantastic speech tonight. Now we have some fantastic questions by our audience, both online and here. Uh, let's go into the back right. <laughs> Me. Hi, my name is Elian Ramos, and I have asked this question before uh, here. Um, there was, there's been a lot of outcry in the community uh, in terms of, um, we, we're asking the president to stop deportations. So, <laughs> thank you. So, um, what is the president's plan to stop the deportations and also to bypass the obstruction in Congress in terms of immigration. Uh, that's a good question. This is a, a, a question that you may have heard the President himself answer on a couple of occasions. It's not uncommon for, uh, for the President to be asked this question directly. He generally answers it in a couple of different ways. The first is if we really want to address the problem that we have with our broken immigration system. That's one, there aren't many things on which there is bipartisan agreement in Washington, D.C., but there is bipartisan agreement that our immigration system is broken and needs to be fixed. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons for doing so. You highlighted some of them, that there are, that, that this is having a devastating impact uh, on some communities, on many communities in this country. Um, there are also significant economic benefits to be enjoyed from getting immigration reform done. There's a, uh, there are strong indications that, in, that, uh, that our economy would grow faster if we were to solve our, our immigration challenges, uh, that, that the unemployment, that jobs would be created, the unemployment rate would go down, uh, and that it even reduced the deficit. So there are a whole lot of reasons why people can be in favor of immigration reform. Now, what's also true to solve a problem that is that big and that, um, uh, that uh, um, how should I say this? To solve a problem that is so ingrained in our current federal policy, you need legislation. There is simply no, the, the president can't use just the stroke of a pen to solve this problem. Um, there have been some aspects of this problem that the president has been able to address through the stroke of a pen. So you'll recall that uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the president's administration through the Department of Homeland Security put in place a deferred uh, action program that allowed uh, undocumented immigrants to this country who came to the United States uh, as a child uh, were given deferred action, that they wouldn't be prosecuted immediately. Um, so that was certainly one step that had a, a tangible impact in helping communities and individual families in some communities feel more secure. But to solve the broader, more persistent problem that exists, it's going to require legislation. Uh, now, getting significant and important legislation through this Congress over the course of the last three years uh, has not been easy. Uh, but there, if, if there's any problem on which Congress has been able to make some progress, it's immigration reform. We saw uh, over, the, over the early part of last year that Democrats and Republicans in the United States Senate got together and hammered out a compromise piece of legislation that did pass the United States Senate with bipartisan support. The good news about that legislation is it generally reflected the principles that the President himself had laid out. Uh, it increased security for our border. Uh, it would ensure that employers uh, are playing on a level playing field by uh, improving enforcement and making sure that all employers were playing by the rules when it comes to uh, verifying the employment of the people that they were hiring. It would reform our legal immigration system. There are too many people who are stuck in a really long line and uh, who are trying to play by the rules, who are trying to, to follow the, the system as prescribed, uh, but that system isn't working very efficiently, so we need to reform that system. Uh, and as you pointed out, we need to have a, a path to citizenship for undocumented workers who are already in this, uh, who are already in this country, so there is compromise. There is a template for compromise that exists. Uh, there is bipartisan support for it, and it's already passed one of two houses of Congress. So we're making a lot of progress uh, on this. 
Um, the other piece of good news is that just in the last 10 days or so, we have seen more indications from Republicans in the House that they are considering a variety of principles that they may put forward about what they would like to see in immigration reform. That is typically the precursor to uh, House Republicans ac actually making a decision to put forward a specific piece of legislation and to take a vote on it. So there are some encouraging signs uh, uh, about progress that can be made on this issue. Uh, this is a top priority of the President's, and that's why you heard the President talk about it pretty persuasively in the speech tonight. Uh, and over the course of the last year, since the last election, this was in, well, I guess I should say, in the last election, the, campaign, the President campaigned on this very aggressively. This was a, uh, uh, a focal point of the stump speech that he gave all across the country. Um, and I'm, I am confident in saying that it is part of the reason that the President was reelected with a strong majority of the American public. So uh, the President will continue to make this a priority. The President will continue to make, this, make the case publicly about why Congress should take this action. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the President at the same time is also the President of the United States, and he's responsible for enforcing our laws. Uh, that's why these deportations continue, but it's also why the President is redoubling his efforts to get Congress to take action to ultimately change those laws that everybody acknowledges is bro are broken uh, so that we can finally fix this system, strengthen our economy, uh, and deal with um, uh, a population that uh, reflects uh, our her nation's heritage uh, as a nation of immigrants uh, and reflects what we pride in our country so much, which is the values that we use in which we treat other people. Right. We are touching on a lot of very important issues, uh, particularly just covered immigration reform. Thank you again to our panelists for covering these issues. Want to do a quick plug. One, if you're not following Josh on Twitter, please do, at jernest44 yes. on Twitter. Follow me. You're welcome. <laughs> he did not tell me to do this ahead of time, but yes. go follow him on Twitter, Twitter at jernest44. And again, too, if you want to, um, uh, get us a question if you're online, hashtag so2chat. We're doing that on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Vine, and Google+. Plus. All look some great digital medium. So appreciate you being with us again online. Speaking of Facebook, let's go to Facebook for a second. <laughs> Everyone's hands in the room went down. Come back to you. Okay. How does Obama intend to pass the blockage that some uh, congressional members have put up in order to achieve success in the agenda? By the way, great speech. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of touched on this a yeah. second ago, Josh. I, uh, I did. I'll, I'll just pick up on where I left off, I guess, which is simply that there is a Republican, Republicans are in control of the House of Representatives, Democrats are, are in control of the United States Senate, and there's a Democratic president. That means that anything that's going to move through the United States Congress is going to have to be, by definition, bipartisan. So what, that, what, that is why you saw so much of an emphasis from the president tonight on trying to find common ground in Congress. And when you're, when you're talking about the kinds of things that the President believes should be a priority, expanding economic opportunity for the middle class, uh, providing support to our veterans, the, the kind of support that they've, uh, not just the support that they deserve, but the support that they've earned. Uh, when you talk about this range of issues, immigration reform is certainly among them, we should be able to find some common ground uh, and make some progress on them. Uh, but what is also true is that the President of the United States is the leader of the free world. He's the most powerful elected official in the United States of America, and there are some things that he can do to make progress on his own, particularly in those areas where Congress is refusing to move. Uh, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks uh, in making reference to the fact that the President has a phone on his desk uh, and a pen in his hand. Uh, and the President can use that pen to sign executive orders to make progress on a range of issues. You may have read uh, just this morning that. Uh, that the president, as he mentioned in his speech today, I guess I don't have to say just that it was reported this morning, he actually said it in his speech tonight, uh, that he will be signing uh, an executive order to increase the minimum wage for workers of federal contractors. That is an important step. Uh, but part of that, the reason that he's going to take that step is because last year he gave a State of the Union address in which he called on Congress to raise the minimum wage for everybody. They didn't act, so a year later the President's going to do what he can, raise the minimum wage for the workers for federal contractors, and continue to push Congress to raise the minimum wage. The other thing that the President can do is the President has a telephone on his desk, and when the President calls people, people answer the phone. Uh, so the President can play a pretty important role in mobilizing leaders all across the country, whether it's business leaders, leaders in academia, uh, local elected officials, to get engaged in an effort to make progress on specific things. Roberto was talking a little bit earlier about uh, uh, 
uh, about expanding access to a college education. Uh, about 10 days ago, the president convened a meeting here at the White House where he invited more than 100 leaders uh, of colleges and universities from all across the country, and the price of admission for attending that meeting was a specific commitment from a college or university president that they would make a change to either their financial aid uh, programs or to their mentoring programs to expand access to their college to more students with middle class backgrounds or f with students who are trying to get into the middle class. Uh, or to do a better job of retaining students that came from middle class background to ensure that once they were enrolled in that college, that they actually were able to graduate within four years. So that is, that is individual colleges and universities without legislation, without committing additional federal dollars to something, making specific commitments to the President of the United States to uh, improve their offerings in a way that it opened up a college education to more students. So that's just an example of how the President can can play a role in mobilizing action all across the country. And the president is determined to make 2014 a year of action. And he's going to use his phone and he's going to use his pen uh, to keep that promise. And where possible, where Congress is willing to act, and hopefully it's on immigration reform, he'll work with Congress to get that done too. They only answer my phone calls when I call. <laughs> but when you're president, they do. And I just can't emphasize enough the phone and the pen. You heard the president tonight speak about the year of action, him willing to do anything he can, his power to move this forward. One more from online, I'll go to the room, promise. Uh, from Twitter, we millennials seem to think we're invincible. <laughs> How will the president get more young people to realize the importance of the Affordable Care Act? It's from Morgan Rubin. Um, no, that is a great question. As you heard the president say tonight, um, nine million people have signed up for private health coverage or Medicaid since June, because of the reforms in the Affordable Care Act, and we are incredibly proud of that progress. Uh, but nobody is invincible. The president told a story tonight of a woman named Amanda Shelley, who had been locked out of the individual market because of a pre-existing condition. Fortunately, January 1 came along. She was able to get coverage. Before the end of the week, she was in the hospital with emergency surgery. That's something that could happen to anyone, and all of us know that. Young people know it, older folks know it. Everybody knows that when you don't have insurance, you're one accident or one illness away from bankruptcy. And we are going to be out there talking to folks. We're going to be working with all of you in your communities to make sure that, that folks who are uninsured know about the opportunities that they have. But this isn't a hard sell. People know that they need health insurance to protect their families and protect their bank accounts. I know I mentioned hashtag so to chat. Don't forget hashtag get covered. Uh, we need to make sure we're letting folks know about that and getting folks to visit healthcare.gov and spread the message like the president said tonight in his speech. Questions from this area? Right here. Yes, I was um, wondering, I was wanting um, a follow-up question about, you know, the, how the president was going to take unitary action, and do you, do you have any concern that um, it will read as legacy politics? Is it that it might take Obama seem that he's given up and will do just, do it his way? Mm -hmm. You know, how are we going to create this bipartisan, um, you know, cooperation that he's, he talked about in his speech. Sure. I, I'd say two, say two things about that. The first thing is simply that executive action is not a substitute for legislative action. That, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about immigration reform, uh, oftentimes in order to take action that's more enduring and that can't just be uh, reversed, uh, it's important for Congress to actually pass legislation. Uh, and that's why the kind of executive actions that the president can take while important uh, are not necessarily uh, a substitute for robust legislative action. Uh, the second thing that I would say is ostensibly the reason that you run for and get elected to Congress is to pass legislation that you think is in the best interest of the country. And uh, there should be, for all our differences, I I'm not trying to paper over the differences and neither is the president that people have. The president's not asking people to compromise on uh, on closely held principles uh, that, uh, that motivate them to public service. What the president is asking Democrats and Republicans to do is to look for common ground. You know, at the end of last year, there was a lot of pessimism about Washington, D.C., but something really important happened. Something happened that most people didn't predict, uh, predicted wouldn't happen, which is that uh, Paul Ryan, who is the Republican Budget Committee Chair in the House, sat down at the table with Patty Murray, who is the top Democrat on the Senate Budget Committee, and they sat down together and they brokered an agreement. 
Now, this was not a historic agreement. It was not a watershed agreement. There was nothing uh, particularly broad about it. But what they did was they worked through regular order. They sat down across the table from one another, and they tried to find common ground. And they found a little slice of common ground. And what they were able to do is then to take that agreement uh, and put it on the floor of the House of Representatives. And even though Democrats didn't get every sing single thing that they want, they wanted, a lot of Democrats voted for it. And even though Republicans didn't get every single thing that they wanted, a lot of Republicans voted for it. Same thing happened in the Senate. The president signed it into law. Again, not a historic agreement, but you know what it did? It bought down 60% of the sequester. And it increased funding for early childhood education. And it increased funding for research and development around, a range of other, among a range of other things. And it means that we probably won't have, knock on wood, uh, any more crisis around a government shutdown. So this is a relatively small agreement, but it is, it is an indication that there still is hope that we can get things done in Congress. Uh, so again, I, I don't want to be overly optimistic about it, but there is a template for us to follow in terms of getting some important things done, some areas where there is common ground. Uh, and there are some important areas where there is common ground, whether it's early childhood education uh, or uh, expanding access to a college education, some measures that would create jobs, infrastructure spending. There is no such thing as a Democratic or Republican bridge, for example. Uh, we should be able to get comprehensive immigration reform done because there are Democrats and Republicans who support it. So that's the kind of uh, strategy that the president will use, which is he will move uh, unilaterally when he can, but he also wants to take advantage of every opportunity to work with Congress to find common ground and make progress on these kinds of core values that Democrats and Republicans share. Let me take a minute just to give you an example. Um, let's take the minimum wage. You know, you heard a year ago the president stood up and he asked Congress to increase the minimum wage for the entire country. Um, as you all know, that hasn't happened. But in the ensuing year, what he's done is gone and looked at companies that have done that voluntarily and seen these companies see that raising the wages uh, for their workers has actually improved their bottom line. And he's pointed to these companies and cheered them and said, you know what, I'm an employer too. So Costco can lead by example, so can the federal government. So the executive order isn't saying, you know, I'm do, isn't saying I don't want Congress to raise the minimum wage, but he can lead by example, and he's going to raise the f minimum wage for federal contract workers because that's good for the workers, but it's also good for the American taxpayers because just like Costco is getting value for their money by paying workers more, we can get values for our money by paying workers more. Another Twitter plug. You can follow Betsy Stevenson <laughs> <laughs> at CEA Betsy, E-Y, at CEA Betsy, please do. Take another one from in the room. How's our panel doing, guys? Oh. All right. Let's go right here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ashley Wilson. I work for Network, the National Catholic Social Justice Lobby. And my question is about the executive order to raise minimum wage for federal contract workers. From what I've read and what I heard, it's just for new contract workers and people who would renew their contract. So I'm wondering what the president's plan is to make sure that existing federal contract workers still benefit from an increase in a wage that they desperately need. Some good economic questions going on. Um, that's a great question. And you know, thinking about how we were gonna do the executive order, we had to think about what the president's legal authority is to actually increase the wages for contractors. And he, um, you know, while he does desperately believe in raising the minimum wage for all workers, um, he also has a responsibility to do what makes the, uh, boost the economy and efficiency um, in his contracting. And so uh, it would, uh, that is what, one of the reasons why the executive order is going to apply to new contracts, because we've got, when we have contractual arrangements, we can't go back and blow those contracts up. We've got to honor the contracts we've signed. As contracts come up, we are going to be uh, asking all of our uh, contractors to raise the, the, their wage. I will tell you as an economist who studied how people react to writing on the wall, often they do start to move ahead of time. You know, they know that they're going to have to compete uh, when it comes up for a renewal, when it, uh, they're going to have to compete by uh, paying workers more. And, you know, our hope is that a lot of these contractors are going to start moving in that direction ahead of time. But where our legal authority is, is to be able to insist on that at the time uh, that we're opening up a new contract. Thank you very much. How many of you all heard the president speak about climate change tonight? Yeah? All right. So this question is from Twitter. It's probably most likely for Dan up here. Dan's getting the microphone ready. 
is the all of the above energy strategy working? This is from Joy Marquart on Twitter. Is the all of the above energy strategy working? Okay. Yeah, I think you heard the, the president speak to that tonight, and I think uh, it reflects the really incredible progress we've made in the last five years kind of across the board in the energy space. I think if you look at renewables, for example, we've more than doubled the amount of uh, electricity we're producing from wind and solar power. In, in 2012, nearly half of the new energy capacity that was added, half of the new generating capacity, new power plants in this country were wind power. That's just an amazing statistic. And part of the reason that those things are happening is because of administration support. Uh, for renewables, and that's another thing the president talked about tonight was ending support for or subsidies for fossil fuels and getting them into clean renewable energy. So um, we're making progress across the board, and I think you heard the president talk about both oil and gas, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and talked about some of the things that he's put in place. For example, fuel economy standards that were put in place in the first term that will double the mileage of our cars uh, between now and 2025 and will save consumers over the lifetime of that program literally $1.7 trillion at the pump. So we're making good progress in uh, diversifying our sources of energy, getting more affordable energy, um, and uh, um, at the same time, creating jobs and driving our pollution down. If you look at carbon pollution in the US, the president said tonight that over the last years, no nation on earth has reduced its carbon pollution more than the United States of America. We're down about 11% uh, versus um, eight years ago. But there's much more to do. I think you heard the president say that we have tough choices to make and he outlined some things that he's going to do. For example, setting uh, carbon standards for the first time for power plants. Uh, we have standards for mercury and other pollution to limit those things from power plants, but nothing that limits the amount of carbon pollution we put in the air. So that's uh, an important thing that we're gonna be doing in the, in the coming months. Um, but. Uh, I think there's a lot of economic opportunity here. There's a lot of uh, job potential here. But the president also underscored that we really need to act. And as he said tonight, you know, as far as climate is concerned, the debate is settled. Climate change is a fact. And when our children's children look us in the eye and ask us if we did all we could to leave them a safer, more stable world with newer sources of energy, he wants to be able to say that, yes, we did. Yes, we did. First of all, I want to let you know, if you're online, thank you for keeping your questions coming in because hashtag SOTUChat is trending nationwide right now. So keep your questions coming online, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google+, Vine. We're going to take one more from the audience. I'm going to alternate for a little bit. Let's go to this gentleman right here. How you doing? Nate Tan, McKenzie, Petersburg, Virginia. Um, my question is, I know we're speaking a lot about uh, immigration reform and also the minimum wage but what effort is being made to help with convicted felons and rehabilitation rather than, rather than allowing those into folks to be consumed by rejection and thus returning back to the system that brought them to that place in the first place? I want to take that one. Well, you want to take a shot at that one? I, <laughs> let, me, let me begin. I, let me just begin, and I, I can speak to this from an education standpoint. I mean, we believe that uh, we have to do much more to make sure that uh, our education system uh, uh, does all it can to ensure that every young person stays on track to graduate from high school, uh, prepared for a productive career for citizenship, uh, and, and full engagement in their communities uh, and for college. And here we, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I think, you know, you heard the president point to some um, encouraging signs tonight. Uh, we have the highest today uh, graduation rate uh, in our high schools that we've seen in three decades. That is the increase that we've seen in the graduation rate since you know, about the mid-2000s has translated into 100,000 additional young Latino men and women graduating from um, high school, 40,000 young African-American men and women graduating from high school. Uh, so that's tremendous progress. We have to be proud of that. But we have a lot more to do. We are still lose a million young people a year in our educational pipeline because many of those young people become disengaged uh, in their studies uh, from their educational system. 
Uh, so we, we have a, a strong framework to do more to make sure that we're beginning to turn around some of these pr schools uh, and, and really get into our communities and uh, develop meaningful partnerships to make sure that we're engaging our young people early, helping them to succeed. We have an effort underway through the School Improvement Grants Program. Over the last four years, we've invested over $4 billion in some of our uh, on some of our neediest schools that are producing over half of our dropouts, three quarters of our dropouts of color coming from these schools, uh, and providing them a new day for learning, a new day uh, to support a better curriculum, a stronger set of support services, stronger community and parent engagement, uh, and, uh, and a clear focus on high expectations for all of those young people. We're also doing more to make sure that uh, we're getting to our families early and that they have the supports and, and uh, that they need to be able to be successful uh, with, their, with, their, uh, with their children. Right? And part of that is through the Promise Neighborhoods uh, initiative that uh, we've launched uh, across the country to provide a continuum of supports and services not only to young people but also to their families, uh, especially in those middle and high school years uh, uh, as they think about their future. Uh, the president has just recently uh, designated some new promise zones uh, around the country uh, to look at what we can do to support uh, uh, our uh, local municipalities uh, in this work to really build stronger and more stable communities uh, for our young people. We believe that's a, that's a critical preventative uh, piece uh, to the question that you raise. So let me just add that we know uh, that there is a very clear link between um, what's happening in the justice system and young men of, particularly young men of color's interactions with the justice system and then what happens with their labor force participation. And the president said tonight, um, we are stronger when America fields a full team. He was talking about getting the long-term unemployed back to work, but that's a general philosophy. We are stronger when America fields a full team. And that means we need everybody to be able to participate to their fullest extent. Um, and so we're certainly thinking about all the ways in which we can boost labor force participation and make sure that we're getting people integrated um, back into the community, back into the labor force, whatever's taken them out, whether it's coming out because you had a baby, whether it's coming out because you've been long-term unemployed, whether it's coming out because you had an interaction with the justice system. We want to get everybody back in, uh, everybody participating and making sure that we're fielding a full team. Uh, Marlon, I just want to add uh, this. That's a great answer. I, the, what, the other thing I'd want to add to, to, uh, to all of this is just to reassure you of the President's own personal commitment to this issue, that he himself feels uh, a very strong conviction uh, to serve as a role model to young men in particular. Uh, it was about a year ago uh, this month that the President traveled back to his old state Senate district in Chicago. It was the first time he'd been back there uh, as President of the United States. Uh, and it was just a few weeks after Hydea Pendleton uh, had been uh, shot and killed uh, on a playground uh, on the south side of Chicago. And while he was there at a local high school, the president visited uh, with uh, some young men who were students at that school who were part of uh, a, a local program in Chicago, in Chicago called the Becoming a Man program. Uh, and the president uh, of the United States had the opportunity to sit around a, a classroom with, uh, I think it was uh, a couple dozen young men and talk to them about their lives and talk to them about the challenges that they were facing on a daily basis, talk to them about the benefits they were receiving from this specific mentoring program. The president to this day talks about the experience of sitting down with those men. Uh, and I, I think you can expect that you're gonna hear more from the president about what he himself, what he would like to do to try to serve as a, a more public role model, but also what kinds of things can he do to inspire others to take a more active role in their communities in serving as a mentor or a role model uh, to, to young men and women uh, in, in communities that uh, are overlooked too often. So I would encourage you to stay tuned and hear more from the President on this uh, in the months ahead. Powerful story and uh, fantastic answers all around to a very, very, very uh, great, great question. Um, folks, our special guest, which was, right. has arrived. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Please give it up for those of you online. We are joined by Labor Secretary Tom Perez. Please give it up for the Secretary. Secretary, we thank you for joining us tonight.
great to be here. We know you had a chance to uh, see the speech live. Do you want to give us any thoughts and comments for being in the chamber? Wow. You know, they pay me to do this job. I can't believe it. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, this was my first rodeo, and uh, it was remarkable. We were just with the president about uh, three minutes ago uh, off the motorcade, and he had a hop in his step, and opportunity is who we are, and that's what we were talking about. And uh, got to spend a little time with Cody afterward to get a sense of uh, reaction. And, you know, it's, uh, we got a lot of work to do. And he laid it out. And uh, we need your help because uh, we've got, we've made a lot of progress. And Betsy and others have outlined the progress we've made. You all know it. Uh, but, you know, our values as a nation are making sure that we take care of everyone. And... I've met uh, so many people lately who are long-term unemployed, like the woman you uh, met tonight sitting next to the First Lady. I, s I spent an hour with her today. Uh, that could be you, that could be me, but for the grace of God. And uh, that is many people who may be listening tonight. And so, uh, you know, it's, it, the, the energy in that room is remarkable. And I think there's really going to be a lot of action, as the President talks about, this year. Uh, some of it will be with Congress. I'm confident immigration reform will be one of those things. I'm hopeful that the minimum wage will be one of those things. Uh, and I'll remind you that the last time the minimum wage was raised, the president was George W. Bush. It was divided government. We can get these things done. You know, I worked for Senator Kennedy in 1996, right after the Gingrich shutdown. They said you couldn't get anything done. And the American people demanded otherwise. And you know what happened that year? We had welfare reform. We had immigration reform. We raised the minimum wage. We had a hate crimes bill. There was a big health care bill that uh, ushered in the era of medical records privacy, all in a presidential election year. And what you heard from the president was an unremitting optimism that we can get things done now if we can marshal the will. And the ideas were presented, and uh, the energy was palpable, and uh, we're going to keep going tomorrow. I'll be with the president tomorrow morning at Costco, Prince George's County. Uh, you know what? By the way, I'm going to show you something. I, my, I've been going to Costco so long that I found my Costco card tonight. <laughs> I kid you not. This Costco card is dated 9-1996. This card is so old that I had hair. <laughs> okay? And look at this. I mean, I'll pass this around to people. I had hair in this photo. Okay? And we're going to go there tomorrow because, you know, Jim Senegal, the founder of Costco, embodies that opportunity is who we are as a nation, what the president said tonight. He rejects the false choice that you either take care of your workers or you take care of your shareholders. That's a false choice. We can do both. He understands not only do you take care of your workers, but you leverage what you have as a major uh, purchaser to make sure your supply chain treats its workers fairly. So, you know, the go, next time you go to Costco, and I hope it's this week. Go buy strawberries. Go buy vegetables. Because you know what? Costco makes sure that every supplier who's selling them vegetables is treating their workers fairly. You know? And you know why they do it? Because it's the smart thing to do and it's the right thing to do. And those vegetables and those fruits are delicious and they're inexpensive, okay? And so that's what we're gonna talk about. That's what the president's gonna go all around the country talking about, access to opportunity, how we can make this country uh, the American dream for everyone, like it was uh, for my parents when they came from the Dominican Republic, like it's been for my siblings. Those fundamental building blocks of prosperity. You Dominican in the back? Dominicano. All right. My, uh, the most important thing for my family in the next three months is when the Red Sox come here after uh, they get the crown, because my, my son's going to be wearing his, uh, you know, big poppy shirt, and he is hoping to get that picture. So we digress. You know, we Dominicans, you can't help it. It's in the blood. Uh, so we're going to keep moving. And I, I, I want to stop talking, but I tell you, it's so exciting to have been there with the president tonight uh, and see the energy in the room. And uh, the work is ahead. But I have an unremitting optimism that uh, the opportunity agenda that he outlined is going to be a reality and that we're going to continue to make progress, whether it's the minimum wage for uh, uh, you know, government contracts that he announced today, minimum wage for America that will be passed in short order 
immigration reform, all the other things that are about those building blocks for prosperity. Uh, that's what we're all about, and that's what we're going to keep doing. And uh, it's great to be here, and I look forward to taking any questions you have. Perfect. First of all, I'll give it up for the secretary. <laughs> secretary, we're joined by this fantastic audience in here. We're also joined online uh, by several thousands of people who are tweeting their questions at hashtag so to chat. This is, given his sports analogy, it's also probably a bad time to announce that I'm from St. Louis and a Cardinals fan. <laughs> But touche to your Red Sox. Okay, uh, we'll do a couple of questions for the secretary. Let's start with this gentleman right here. Hi, Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming. Uh, David Feynman with the Jewish Federations of North America. We advocate on behalf of people with disabilities and their families. And I know that's an issue that's very, you're very passionate about. We heard a lot about growing the economy and jobs, but as you know, the disability community mm -hmm. is disproportionately underemployed, has no access, limited access to education and training, various aspects of the economy, disincentives to work with their benefits structure. What is the administration, the president, going to do when he's thinking about creating jobs to ensure people with disabilities have access to jobs, to training, to education, all the things he mentioned, but never specifically mentioned people with disabilities in his speech? Good. Thank you for your question. And thank you uh, for your leadership on this issue. You know, I have the opportunity to go around the country and. Uh, very seldom do you see people who come up to you and say, I want to pay more taxes. Uh, but I'll tell you, I've done a lot of work with the disability community, and that's right here day in and day out. I want to pay taxes. I can work. Stop focusing on the uh, dis in the word disability and start focusing more on the ability part of the word disability. That's what it's all about. And that's what the president's all about. And, uh, and, and let me give you some concrete action that has been taken, because this State of the Union is about concrete action. As you know, just a few months ago, we issued a regulation at the uh, Department of Labor under Section 503 that requires employers to establish guidelines uh, and goals for the employment of people with disabilities. Uh, and you know, I'll tell you, uh, I've spoken to employers who are already doing this, and they understand, just like Jim Senegal, he does it because it's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. That's what employers tell me. It's the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. And uh, those regs have helped us really make progress. Uh, you look at the hiring of people with disabilities in the federal government, 29% uh, were really moving up uh, the food chain on that. And that's another concrete step because we're measuring it and we're helping people to make sure that uh, they're engaged in practices, whether it's in the federal government or elsewhere that will enable the hiring. And then most importantly, we have to, uh, or equally importantly, we have to eliminate other barriers. Uh, if you want to make sure that someone's working, uh, you don't want to have a good news, bad news scenario where good news, you've got a job, but bad news, um, your Medicaid that you were previously eligible for, you're no longer eligible. So uh, you're actually worse off than you were before. So one thing that the president's doing is making sure we implode stovepipes around all of our agencies because uh, the true empowerment of people with disabilities involves uh, Medicaid issues and other health care issues. It involves housing, uh, involves transportation, it involves employment, it involves education, it involves the Department of Labor. And that sort of stovepipe implosion is key to the president's opportunity agenda for people with disabilities. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We have a question from Twitter for the secretary. Uh, this is from Kathleen X. How does the president and the administration plan to get business leaders on board with raising the minimum wage to $10.10? Well, come to Costco tomorrow in Prince George's <laughs> County. You can see my photograph in person from 1996 when I had hair <laughs> and no replacement parts. And uh, I'll tell you, I've spoken to many businesses. And, and you, look at, uh, you look at the data and the polling data, and uh, I think it was two-thirds of small businesses favor an increase in the minimum wage. And they do so because they have recognized that your workforce is your most precious commodity. And when you pay people a fair wage, you get a loyal workforce. A hundred years ago, Henry Ford did something radical. He doubled the wages for people on the assembly line. Why did he do that? Well, there are a couple of reasons, uh, starting with the fact that his attrition rate was over 300%. It's hard to build a productive assembly line if you're losing your workers every other week. And so when you pay a higher wage, you have a more stable and productive workforce. And that's what the business community will tell you. And when you pay higher wages, 
you put more pe money in people's pockets. And Betsy, who is the expert on this panel on labor economics, will, will tell you, and she has taught me, uh, that if we really want to grow the economy, a big thing we need to do is expand consumption. In other words, put money in people's pockets. So businesses like it. Uh, and Henry Ford did it because he understood that if the people on his line could afford to buy his cars, that community prosperity would be uh, nationwide prosperity. And so uh, the businesses that I talk to uh, day in and day out tell me that we need to do this, and we need to do this yesterday. Awesome. Let's take one more from the audience. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Terry from Seattle. So I just have a couple questions <coughs> from, um, I have a question from one of my Twitter <coughs> followers. They wanted to know, why isn't the U.S. making a more aggressive opposition to Russia's violent <coughs> anti-LGBTQA and the laws in face of the Olympics? Well, I think the president's been pretty clear about the notion that uh, it, nobody should be a victim of discrimination on the basis of their sexual orientation, that if you work hard, bless you, and play by the rules. You, bless all of you, by the way. I don't want to just <laughs> single you out. That uh, it shouldn't matter who you are. It just shouldn't matter who you love. It shouldn't matter who you worship. Uh, none of these things are, are relevant. And uh, I think the president's been uh, very forceful in, in saying that in connection with everything. And I'm, I, I had the privilege of sitting in this room to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Title IX with, uh, among others, Billie Jean King. And I'm very excited that she will be leading uh, the U.S. delegation to Sochi in a couple weeks. Uh, she has been a champion for fairness, equality, and inclusion, and I think the president's choice of her uh, is a real testament to his commitment to those issues. Absolutely. Mr. Secretary, I just have one more for you. I know um, we got to get you going in a second, but this is from Twitter from Cameron Fry. What do we do to encourage young people to work hard and contribute to society? Well, as a parent of a 17, a 15, and 11-year-old, I'm, I'm thinking about that question quite a bit. Uh, and and you know, I think it starts with um, providing access to educational opportunity. Yep. You know, my parents came here from the Dominican Republic. I'm the youngest of five, and it was all about education, education, education. Uh, education is the great equalizer. Um, higher education is one of the biggest engines of social mobility that this nation has ever known. And so I think it starts with getting that educational foundation. But then it also is uh, about the work ethic and getting those opportunities to see the world and see different work opportunities. And, and we spend a lot of time trying to get uh, internships and other things for people. Uh, I'm a big believer in uh, things like cooperative ed education and, and educational models that give people real world experience. Because uh, one of my least favorite words in the English language is the word soft skills. Uh, because the soft skills are actually the essential skills. And so uh, your classroom education helps you get uh, those hard skills. And then these internship and other experiences help you get the essential skills of showing up on time, being part of a team, understanding that we're all in this together, working hard. And, uh, and so I think uh, the more opportunities you get to work under the tutelage of somebody, uh, the better off you will be. Because among other things, you'll figure out what you like and what you don't like. And my biggest advice when I talk to my kids and when I talk to students that I used to teach is, you know, figure out what gets you out of bed in the morning. Find your passion. You know, happiest is the person whose job is his or her hobby because then you never have to work a day in your life. And that is always what I try to say. And, and the future is bright. There's so much out there. Businesses want to grow, as the president pointed out in tonight's State of the Union. And uh, many businesses involve working with your hands. There's a really bright future in America, once again, for uh, people who work with their hands in the building trades, in other uh, skilled trades that are the ticket to the middle class. And so opportunities abound across this nation, but you need to be willing you know, to get those hard skills and then get those opportunities to hone the essential uh, life skills. And uh, when you do that, I think you can make real progress. Secretary, thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, really great to be here it. with y'all. Thanks for your time. Secretary Tom Perez, everyone. Really appreciate it. First hand view of what happened uh, live at the State of the Union. Really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Secretary. Good night.
I want to take a moment again to introduce our panel. If you're just joining us online, first of all, hashtag so to chat. We are trending nationally. Make sure to get, get your questions coming back in. We have Josh Ernest, Betsy Stevenson, Roberto Rodriguez, Dan Utech, and Kristen Link Young, fantastic advisors here at the White House. I'm going to take a couple questions in the room. Sir. Um, Jose Ristimunio, my question is to follow up on uh, immigration reform. As we know, the Senate passed the bail. Uh, the, obviously, um, the president supports immigration reform to be done this year. The House, they were seeing that there's a potential. They're unveiling this pr set of principles. Now, my question is, if they are one of their principles, as I've been hearing, is that they would have a path to legal status, but not a path um, to full citizenship. And if this country, being that it was founded on immigrants, I don't think it's a place to have second-class citizens. So my, my question will be, what is the president's take on this? Sure. Uh, that's a good, a good question and a key question that I think will loom a pretty large in the weeks ahead after we see the the Republican proposal. It's hard to tell you exactly how the President's going to react to what the Republican proposal is until we actually see it. Uh, so it's hard for me to react to that directly. But I certainly uh, can say to you that the President agrees with the sentiment that you've expressed. Uh, he's, when he's been asked this question about whether or not he would uh, compromise on a piece of legislation to reform our immigration system without providing a path to citizenship for undocumented workers who are already in this country. What the President says is, why would we miss this once-in-a-life opportunity, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, to deal with a, what is a significant challenge in so many communities all across the country? Why would we pass a big piece of legislation that would increase uh, security along the border, that would level the playing field for workers, that would reform our legal immigration system, while leaving the status of 10, 11, 12 million people who are already in this country unresolved? So the President is determined to make sure uh, that we don't allow uh, the second class status that currently exists to persist even after a piece of comprehensive immigration reform legislation passes. So we'll see, we'll see what the Republican details are in their proposal and we'll figure out a way to deal with it from there. But, uh, but, uh, but the sentiment that you've expressed that leaving uh, in place uh, a, a large group of people who play a critical role in so many communities across this country uh, and to allow their legal status or, or their citizenship, si citizenship status to be unresolved doesn't make any sense. All right. Thanks, Josh. We have time, folks, for one more question. One more question. I'll get a chance to pick someone in the room. And again, if you're online, thank you for participating. Keep hitting hashtag so to check because we have a good chat going on. One more question. One more question. Oh, so, oh. <laughs> thanks, thanks for uh, helping me out. My name is Evan Gildenblatt. Uh, I work for the Kent State University Office of Federal Relations here in D.C. Uh, over the past 30 years or so, we've seen a pretty drastic reduction in, in state funding for uh, public institutions. And along those lines, uh, we've seen an increase in the money that's going to uh, largely unregulated, for-profit, private institutions uh, who seem to be taking away the focus from where it really needs to be, and this was something that the Senate Help Committee highlighted. My question for you is, what can the state universities like Kent State, you know, large and small across the country, do to work with the administration uh, in order to help mitigate the effects of, you know, these uh, issues of the past 30 years or so? Well, thanks for the question. You know, uh, this is gonna give me an opportunity to also share one of my favorite quotes from the uh, speech tonight, which is that the nation that goes all in on innovation today will lead the economy tomorrow. That's a great, that's a great quote, right? I mean, that captures you know, not only the sentiment of what we're trying to do in terms of the arc of the economic policies, but also in terms of our educational system. I, I think the uh, path toward an innovation economy is really paved in our classrooms and at our universities. Uh, so one of the most important things that uh, our higher education system can do is to open up those pathways uh, for a greater share of our public. You know, the president has uh, challenged us at the beginning of his administration uh, to, again, regain our international leadership with the highest share of college graduates by 2020, right? That means we have to go from about 40% to about 60% in terms of the share of our young people that are completing a college degree. Uh, and today, you know, we have uh, only about 58% uh, 
uh, of uh, our population that begins college, finishes a college degree in, four, in six years even, uh, let alone four years. So, uh, you know, we, ha we believe we have a shared responsibility uh, to be able to do more to make sure that those doors of higher education are open uh, for, uh, for um, the American public and that we have every opportunity to be able to really persist through those doors and complete. And, uh, you know, for two-thirds of America's students who attend higher education at state colleges and universities, that is, it, you know, our, our institutional leaders here are on the front lines of really, you know, helping to shape the future workforce and helping to grow what, what needs to be America's innovation economy. And I'm, I'm very hopeful about this. I feel like we have seen tremendous surges in the number of young people who are on college campuses today. Uh, we've seen great increases, particularly in the number of students of color and first generation college goers that are on college campuses today. And that's a really exciting fact for us. You know, as Josh mentioned just two weeks ago here, we had over 100 college presidents uh, from our private as well as our public colleges and universities committing to doing more uh, to make sure that college is affordable and attainable, attracting more young people into that, into that college pipeline, simplifying the FAFSA, working with superintendents and mayors and others in their communities to open those doors of college opportunity, and then putting in place the types of strategies to help our young people be able to be successful once they get onto campus. That means we have to redesign our college courses for 21st century learners. It means that we have to do more around college advising it means we need to do more to make sure that we're helping to engage in, uh, uh, in uh, mentorship and in learning opportunities and learning communities for many of our young people who are on college campuses so that they can be successful in their courses. So, you know, we believe we have a strong role to play as a federal partner in that, in that work, but uh, we really uh, applaud the leadership of our nation's colleges and universities. We think that there's a critical role to play there too. We started with Roberto, and we're going to end with Roberto. First of all, please give it up to our panel. Josh Ernest, Bessie Stevenson, Roberto Rodriguez, Dan Utech, Kristen Link Young. Thank you all for taking the time following the speech to do this. Please give it up for yourselves and our online audience. They were fantastic. So to chat trending nationally. And last but not least, please give it up to the President of the United States of America for a fantastic speech tonight his fifth day of being addressed. Thank you all for joining us tonight. The conversation does not end here. Make sure you follow us the next few days at whitehouse.gov forward slash so too. We have the big block of cheese coming up. We have a Google Plus hangout with the president. We have much more. This is not just done with uh, the questions that we had tonight. The way we're gonna move this agenda forward is by everyone in this room and you following us online with your engagement in this agenda. We need you. We had to keep moving and let's make this a year of action. Have a good night. Thank you so much.